<clears throat> let's get started. Um, hopefully I'm getting a microphone. I think I am, but you never can tell. All right, so we're going to talk about null and causality and TVD today. Uh, oh, some a couple of notes. Um, my office hours tomorrow, I have to shift them 2.30 to 4.30 again uh, because somebody scheduled over them again. Uh, so apologies. Um, however, the scheduling over is because there's another of the um, CDS talks that is eligible for extra credit. Uh, I was very excited to see a few of you there yesterday. Um, and it looks like we actually have a couple of other submissions as well. Um, so yeah, uh, if you're interested, come by. Uh, I thought the one yesterday was interesting because it was like the least data science -y talk that I've seen them do at all. Uh, so it was kind of interesting. Um, and then the other big thing, other big news, right, is uh, Project 2 will be released on Tuesday uh, with the first checkpoint on the 5th of April, second checkpoint on the 12th of April, and then the 22nd of April is when it's due. Uh, it should be very obvious in the project where the checkpoints are. Uh, it's usually labeled conveniently enough checkpoint one. Uh, the thing is, through the magic of Gradescope, um, you kind of have to submit them to three different like assignments. So just uh, keep that in mind. So just look for the, the correct one uh, and uh, let us know if you have any trouble. Um, any questions? Uh, the project is also, uh, I think we decided to do two person groups for that one. Okay. So it is also meant to be kind of a group. Um, so if you're having any trouble finding a group or participating in a group, let us know. Um, all right, assuming there are no questions, uh, all of that will be, it is too, right? Um, so all of that will be, is, you know, explained in the project or in the grade scope or whatever. So, uh, you know, check there if you, if you aren't sure you understand, uh, but that's, uh, that's where we start. Um, Okay, so we're going to talk about the p-value again, uh, just a little bit, um, just to talk about the observed significance level. Um, the reason this is going to come up a bunch of times is because this is a very important topic, uh, and uh, I think we're going to talk about it a little bit more in depth, like its history and that kind of stuff. Uh, it's either like in the next lecture or the one after that, um, but for now, it's the idea of how uh, likely you are to um, hit a value that is kind of not uh, what you expect when you're trying to predict something. So, uh, so that's kind of the, the short version. Um, you know, the longer version is what we talked about a little bit last time, and we'll talk about more as we go forward. Um, but just as a little reminder, um, oh, there's a question. So let's see how hard this question is. So what does the p-value represent? And I'm not going to read those out loud, so hopefully you can read them. All right, we'll give you another little bit. I recognize that you had to probably log in and read through this monster question. So we'll give you a little bit longer than normal. All right, let's call it there. Last couple seconds, get those answers in. All right, it's hard to tell because sometimes I think there's people who are like counted, but don't actually exist. So I'm never sure if I want to wait for the whole thing. That's why I tend to close it a little bit early. Um, all right, so 
Uh, most of you got it. If the null hypothesis is true, if the test statistic is equal to the value that was observed in the data or is even further in the direction of the alternative. So one of the things that we kind of covered last time uh, is just that normally the, the thing that you want is normally the alternative, right? So, but the thing that you can sample for or test for in a sense is the null hypothesis. So you kind of want things that are kind of far away from that. That makes sense. And like I said, we'll talk about this some more uh, with some more examples too. Uh, right now we're kind of talking about it a little bit more in the abstract and kind of what you can do with it, but we'll get into some of the details as we go. All right, so as we talked about last time, uh, and I particularly like to show this slide because this is my idea of high pollutant. This is the best I can do as far as art is concerned. Uh, so uh, I can I can pull a picture from somewhere else and then make something. Um, so uh, we were talking about this a bit before, which is that you know if we have an eternal smoker, uh, you know who's who's a smoker when they're pregnant, uh, what's the birth weight of their children, uh, and what impact might it have? And the reason I bring this up again is because what we want to do is try to figure out can we prove this to be true, right? So what we can do is we can sample from our data set, which we talked about a little bit before, but we can sample from it multiple times um, and we can sample without replacement or we can sample with replacement. Excuse me. Uh, what do you think with replacement means? Uh, go ahead. Right, right. Okay, so it's basically the difference of, to use your example, you know, you have a bag of marbles and you take one out to get your sample, right? The question is, do you put it back in or do you keep it out? Okay, obviously that's going to have some effect on your resultant selection, right? Because it's possible if you put it back in that you could get it again, right? So that's why it's kind of important that we keep track of whether we're doing with replacement. So in other words, are we putting it back in and then potentially getting it again, or if we're doing it without replacement. So um, when we're doing a random permutation like this, uh, what we want to do is pick without replacement. I'm sorry, with replace. Uh, so yeah, sorry, this is like trying to translate code to English. So without replacement. Uh, and so in other words, we're going to pick those marbles and we're going to leave them out. And then we're going to draw the next one to get our sample. Okay. And we're going to talk about, uh, I don't think today, but in the future, we'll talk about why you'd want to do it with replacement. So now we go to the notebook. That is not the right window. There we go. Okay. And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to collect all our babies. Oh, nope. First thing we're going to do is run the top. Then we're going to collect the babies. Um, and we saw this data before, so I'm not really going to talk about it too much. Then we're going to do the same thing we did last time, which is pull out um, just the data that we're interested in. Um, and then specifically, we're going to look at, you know, in the data set we have, which may or may not be a big enough sample to really prove things. Um, but this is the data we know, right? So we have, excuse me, kind of the blue stuff over here. We can see that if the maternal, if the, if the mother wasn't a smoker when she was pregnant, she tends to have a larger uh, birth weight B. Uh, easy for me to say today. All right. So when we look at the data, we uh, can do kind of grouping, right? Um, and look at the average, for example, of those maternal uh, smokers um, and not, uh, and figure out the average birth weight. And as we can see, this kind of seems to be in line with what we think is true. Um, however, let me make sure I'm caught up to where I think I am. Um, however, what we want to do now is we want to think about like, 
what's the difference between the two uh, scenarios? Um, so, I guess I, I kind of left the stuff out that was less interesting than I meant to. Um, so, so the first thing we did, right, was we looked at, uh, we pulled out the average birth weights based on the category that they're in, whether they spoke or didn't smoke. Um, and then now we have that, and now we can look at the difference between those two, right? So we can say, um, just trying to get my like, ordering right, um, but we can pull it out and look at uh, the, uh, I guess the the higher higher baby weight subtracting the lower no the lower baby weight subtracting the higher baby weight, uh, and therefore we get a negative number, right? So, but the weight difference, um, you know, you can look at it and tell, right? But it is a nine ounce difference between the babies. All right. So now we want to start getting closer to something useful. I don't think I left any blanks in here. So we're going to create a method to kind of do that for us, right? So that we don't have to kind of do it by hand each time. So we're just going to take a, a method. But as you notice, and we haven't done this a lot so far, um, you can actually pass in, right, a whole table and a label and a group label so that we can make this method generic. So I don't have to hard code it when I'm creating the method. And instead, I can just use it with any table and any column with another label or with a group label. Uh, and then basically, we'll get the result back of the same thing we did before, but now in a generic way so we can reuse it. All right, so as it says, how do we go about ensuring that the data isn't just badly selected, right? So, or in other words, um, what if, you know, the, the baby weights that we were collecting uh, was just for whatever reason, um, you know, there's some other reason why those babies were uh, lighter weight uh, for, you know, we just, or we just got a completely bad selection. We just happened to pick, um, you know, babies that correlate, you know, uh, correlated with this kind of hypothesis. So what we want to do is start to look at the data more closely. First thing we do, um, I thought I put a note here. Wait, where's, oh yeah, I'll talk, I was going to talk about it later, but I'll talk about it now. Um, so we can just do this kind of print stats, right? And so you've seen me do this a few times, right? When I'm trying to figure out kind of, when I'm trying to understand the data, right? I'm trying to explore the data. Um, and what I think most people kind of end up starting to do is that they start to have a, like a Jupyter notebook or something like that that they can apply to kind of any data set that they want to kind of start to understand. And the process for doing that is called exploratory data analysis. This will not be on any exam. I'm just kind of getting the word out there so you understand what it is. But so this is very simple of what's usually referred to as EDA which is exploratory data analysis. So as you saw in the, you know, in the spinny circle, right, we're exploring the data, but there's uh, kind of a, almost like a formal label for when you're doing that with like the tool chain you're using. Uh, and I think this is one of the things where it's very custom to each individual, how you understand data, right? So like, there's not a universal answer, you know, min, max, and row count is pretty common. But you might want to do other things and maybe maybe histograms make more sense to you or scatter plots make more sense to you or something when you're exploring data so you kind of start to have like a tool chain that you just kind of throw at every data set because you're used to seeing the output of that and so therefore it kind of makes it simpler for you to understand all right so then we can pull out a sample, right? So that's going to get us 10 examples uh, out of the data set um, and, you know, pulled largely at random so that we can start to think about how do we play with this and get some more data. And as you can see, I just put my look at CDA to remind me to talk about that, but I put it too late. So that's why that's there. All right. And, oh, it's because I have the same code twice. So here, oh, that's the whole thing is twice. Um, I thought there was, 
sorry, uh, I just must have done bad copy paste. So that was exactly the same thing we just talked about. So we'll move on from there. Um, and let's talk about nope, some slides. All right, so what we can do, so, okay, so now we have this data set, right? But we aren't confident in kind of the quality of that data set. So what we wanna do is try to figure out a way that we can kind of make the data set bigger without going and interviewing more people, right? Because that's expensive. And the problem with, you know, basically collecting data in general is that it's expensive. Uh, and the more data you collect, the more expensive it gets. So part of the, you know, like data science path, right, is, is uh, lots of academics and researchers and whatever are constantly trying to figure out ways that we can improve the quality of the data that we have without getting more data. Does that make sense? Because you're constantly, you, you can never, generally speaking, you can never have enough data. So what you want to do is take what data you have and try to figure out how can you manipulate that data so that it can be, so they can act like you have more data. All right, does that make sense? Cool, all right. So here's one way we can do it. What if we uh, can start to sample, but what we'll do is first we're gonna shuffle the labels around, okay? So that we kind of have a, a similar data set, except that we have um, the smoker and non-smoker shuffled so that it's now, you know, for lack of a better term, incorrect, right? Any theories why that might be useful? So we can compare the two data sets now, right? And maybe we can see a relationship by showing the fact that, hey, when we shuffle the labels around, it, it, it kind of acts differently than if we leave the labels the way they were. So in other words, like if we have the original data set and we're kind of seeing a correlation between the maternal smoker and baby weights, right? If we shuffle the data around, do we still have that? Or do we lose that correlation? Does that make sense? So this is kind of the formal version of it. So if the null is true, all rearrangements of the labels are equally likely, right? So the null being that there is no relationship between the uh, maternal smoker and baby weights, whereas the alternative is what we suspect is true. So what we can do is to test that, we can actually just shuffle the labels around and then see what happens to our, like our averages basically. Um, and if we do that kind of enough times, we can be satisfied that, hey, when we shuffle the labels around and we you know, kind of keep doing that and shuffling it different ways each time, we can say, oh, look, the correlation's gone. So that means that the original correlation is real, okay? So how do we do that? It's really pretty easy. All right, so we'll take a simple example first. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna make uh, a table of letters, right, from A through E. Um, and then we're gonna pull a sample out of that. Um, and then we can try, now this is where the with replacement part comes becomes important, okay? Because we don't want, we want to do it without replacement uh, so that we, when we pull that data out to do this shuffle label technique, okay? So we're going to just pass into our sample which way, oops, which way we want it to go. And if I can type intuitively enough, nope, I got an extra H in there. Okay, so now we can't, when we pull the sample, we will, sorry, unlike the original, we won't ever get the same result again, right? 
So in this one, this is clearly uh, with replacement was true. So the default is true because we got a C three times. Make sense? So without replacement, we will not get a repeat. Well, if we had a bigger data set, we would get repeats, right? Because it'd be similar. But with our A, B, C, D, E, we won't get repeats. All right. And then why is my computer working so hard? Um, all right. So now what we can do is we can add that shuffle data set essentially into our database or into our table. I can't talk by essentially doing what we did a minute ago. So with replacement, no nope, equals false. And I feel like we want to add, sorry, I'm missing something. Oh, right. And then we want to do, wait, did I, sorry, my friends here. Yeah, okay. Um, but then I, oh, I don't want the whole table back, right? I just want the one new column, which is the shuffled data. So I'm gonna pull that out. Did I do that right? Oh yeah, okay. I think that's right. All right, and so now I have a new table, right? With shuffled labels, okay? So really very straightforward, very simple. Um, so we can move on to kind of doing it with the real data or with our kind of, you know, more real example. And so I'll go with the right, yeah. All right, and then, but I obviously only want to pull out the correct column, except because there's a bunch of them here, I'm going to do it by name. All right, and then let me just break this somewhere where it's gonna work. Ah. I thought you could break. Oh, no, you have to break it on the print. Just so you can kind of see it all at once. Okay, so now I have in my shuffled labels, I took a sample with replacement equal to false so that I don't get repeats. Um, and I'm only going to take some internal smoker. Um, but now I have a bunch of shuffled labels, right? And then... It's always hard to know where you're going to want to talk about stuff. Um, shuffled label. So I'm just going to add it to the column. Sorry, the column to the uh, table. Yes, I do. Even with column. All right, so now I have a new table that has both our kind of original data, right? And then a shuffled label for um, the maternal smoker, whether they smoke or not, um, without replacement so that we can get the same uh, distribution that we had before. And so now we can look at the differences. So, In the first case, what we do is we look at the one with the shuffled data, okay? And we compare the birth weight to the shuffled label. So in other words, these are incorrect, right? And we end up with 0.5 as the difference of the means, okay? However, when we go with the original data, it's a negative nine. So what does that mean? Anybody else? All right. Right. So it's inconsistent with the null hypothesis, or in you know simpler terms, right? 
it means that <clears throat> there does seem to be some impact to the maternal smoking and the birth weight. Because when we get rid of, or when we rearrange the smoking, we go back to, we get closer to the null hypothesis, which is that there is no relationship. Does that make sense? Okay. However, we have this kind of semi-constant problem of doing it once is probably not sufficient, right? Because who knows, when we pull that sample, I think we were sampling 10 or something. When we pull that sample, maybe we just pulled 10 and got lucky. Or then, you know, and they were just the right ones somehow. So what we want to do is we want to do essentially the same thing, but we want to do it a bunch of times so that we can look at um, like lots of different samples and make sure it still holds true. Okay. Because most of the stuff we're doing here, right, is like almost like a, like distance from error. Like we're rarely going to be right we're going to be close to right and that's basically what p-value measures is how close we are to or what's our confidence in the the rightness of our answer all right let me see did i, I can't remember if i left any code out of this one but it looks right we'll see if we get any ears Okay, so basically all I did was take exactly the same code as above, um, and I put it into a method, and I made it a little, or pretty generic, okay? There is one kind of assumed thing here, is that the result will, oh, actually, no, we don't even return the result. So yeah, so this is generic, so I can pass into any table, any label, and whatever the group label is that I want to mess with, and I'll get back an array of the shuffled label. I think maybe I get a table back. Oh no, it actually just does the full on calculation. So it will actually give you the average actually calculated. Um, it's hard on the fly to read code. Um, but so what we did was there, we just kind of ran another example. Okay. Um, so that should have given us a different result. Um, and it probably did, but they're still pretty close, right? Because I remember it was 0.5. So the next thing we do, now here's a note. Um, when I was running this earlier, when I was running this for 2,500, um, which is probably in the right neighborhood for the size we want to do, it was taking a long time to run. So I didn't want to stand here and wait for it. So I have just made it 1,000 so you can see what happens, uh, but not have to wait for the rest of our lives. Um, but it still takes a while. Anybody know like what's taking so long? Yeah. Right. So it's, it's basically going and getting a sample, right? And then count, and then it's shuffling the labels. Then it's um, actually uh, sorry. Oh, actually, I think I kind of misspoke earlier. Um, yeah, sorry. So when it's doing the sample, it's actually getting a sample. The sample is the whole set, right? So it's getting whatever, call it 1,200 rows, okay? Shuffling all the labels, putting it back in there, calculating the average differences, et cetera, a thousand times. And this kind of example is why we don't have you set this stuff up mostly on your laptop, for example, and instead doing it at some place which theoretically can have at least some more dedicated power. Um, in fact, like we were talking about the interview candidates, right? Um, you know, one of them like actually goes and has to get grants to fund their hardware in the cloud so that they can run their data science operations. Like they're so expensive, like even the, the smallest research that she works on takes so much computing resources that she actually gets grant funding to pay for it all, right? All right, but then now we can see that the observed difference rate was a negative nine, which is that? Okay, so, but what we can see here, right, is that largely when we shuffle uh, when we shuffle and we do the sampling and all that jazz, right? 
we can see we're actually very close to the null hypothesis most of the time. If you look at this distribution, right, because it's near zero, which means what? Which means what? Anybody else? Right, so, so and not even just a correlation, but a causal relationship, okay? So um, because we set the null to be kind of like the, I don't know, like the simple case or the, you know, not what we were really expecting case, but something we can kind of measure, um, because it's near zero when we shuffle things around, that means that we are not deviating from it. Um, and we notice that normally we get a, not, a negative nine. Right, so in theory, we could be doing those calculations uh, up here, and instead of getting 0.5, right, it, what would have, what would it mean if we were getting negative nine here too? It might mean that the um, the fact that we're shuffling isn't what's causing that. Uh, exactly, exactly. So, so the value of this number is kind of irrelevant. That what matters is that it's very different from the other one, okay? So that's where we, we start to care, and so we start to play around with it. But then we, we step further so that we don't have to think about that per se, and we can actually measure it by doing the subtraction, right? So we can actually look at, hey, how far are we from zero? Because that's the part we care about. We care about the difference between the two numbers, not the actual numbers. All right. All right. Did I skip a slide? It's certainly possible. Let me just see if I really want to go back to the slides. Oh, yeah, I do. Okay. So we talked about that. I might have gotten a little ahead of myself, but it's okay. So talking about now we can talk about kind of causality for real. Oops. And yeah, and so basically what we're kind of seeing is that, right, that there's definitely a relationship between that spoker and the, the baby's weight. Uh, but moving on from there, what we're gonna do is take kind of another example. Um, which I believe this data set is um, basically showing like what was the impact of doing Botox? Like did it have a negative side effect or not? Um, but the data is very, very simple and that's why we're using it for this example. Um, but long story short, uh, sorry, I kind of paused in the wrong place. Um, so we have a control and uh, you know, let me see how it's actually labeled. Oh, result. So. We have a, you know, what was what did they do, right? And then their their results. So uh, this treatment was basically led led to a, a result of some kind, probably negative. Um, a lot of the time, it seems, right? Just kind of glancing at it. But that's what we want to kind of know is find out. Let's let's see if it's real. And so what we can do, or right, let's let's ask this slightly differently. Um, what, what would we use as a tool right now to be basically, I want to kind of collapse this table and kind of see the data in, in short, right. And be able to understand it a little bit more easily. So what, what might I use to, to do that? Any idea? So hard to like like ask something without actually saying the word. So I want to look at this table of data, and I want to like collapse it so that I can see what is the relationship. Like just kind of visually, what's the relationship between the treatment 
and the outcome and the control group. Yeah. going with some, what would be a really easy way to do that where I wouldn't have to write so much code? Yeah. Oh, no, so it's good. Uh, did anybody else have an answer? Yes, pivot table. Uh, this is the kind of thing a pivot table is really good at. Hey, participants can now see my screen. Uh, I thought they could see it before, but maybe not. Uh, okay, so result and group. So this is a little confusing just because group in this, oh, massive typos. They seem to be doing no damage. So it's a little confusing just because the labeling and stuff, but basically I'm doing a pivot table on that result. And so it's just counting them up. Um, and so we see, um, you know, kind of, the, we can see that relationship, like I said, it's kind of collapsed, which is a little hard to get a sense of when you're looking at the whole table, right? Um, and then obviously there's another way we can do it um, and we'll kind of jump into it, which is to use the group. And this is gonna give us different information, but also kind of to the same end, right? Which is to figure out what's going on, except I have to spell it correctly. Okay, so now what we did was we actually looked at the average across the group, okay? So as you can see here, it seems like the treatment is having, you know, is more likely to be causing one of these results than the control, right? Because it's, it's closer to one here and much closer to zero here. Does that make sense? So don't worry too much about what, like, what we're actually measuring, but it's kind of the idea is we're getting across. And then, um, but as you can see, our data set is ridiculously small, okay? It's only 31. Um, so we want to mess with that so that we can uh, get, you know, we can legitimately <coughs> make the data we have more valuable, which is, is this treatment actually causing a problem? So we use the same function we did before, which is that difference of means, okay? Um, and we're going to see it's a 0.475. So that's just the subtraction, but then we can start to sample against it. Okay, and so we get the simulated difference. So this is, we take the sample um, and shuffle the, uh, shuffle the labels basically. Um, and we notice that when we do that, we get quite a bit different result, right? And then we can do something quite expensive too bad I didn't come up with a stand-up comedy routine for this. Um, but basically we can essentially do the same thing with 10,000 times. Um, and we're kind of, in some ways we're kind of doing it more because we have less data. Does that make sense? So the, you know, when we don't have, when the data is less quality or less good, uh, if we do it more, we can usually get a better answer. Um, hey look, it's done. Then we can see that much like our prior one, and you know, obviously this data is somewhat manufactured to prove my point, right? Um, but we can see that it's also centered kind of around zero. And so we know that there's probably something going on here, right? There's probably a causal relationship between doing the treatment and the uh, control group. And then lastly, this is where, oh boy. And actually I'm gonna cut and paste this cause it's long and I tend to have lots of typos. Lastly, we can now calculate the p-value. So in other words, our confidence that the treatment is having an impact. All right. And so this is our p-value. Um, and if you remember, we usually think about this in terms of a percent. Um, and so this would be like 0.7%, right? So that means that it's in that, when we were kind of using those slang terms before, like highly statistically significant, okay? So, because it's, it's quite a small number. That makes sense? 
Um, yeah, and so this calculation, this is something that I would remember. Um, however, we're going to bring it up a lot. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so it's kind of saying with, it's a, it's a weird number to say, but 0.7% confidence, uh, or let me say it the other, let me say it the other way. 99.3% um, of the time, we expect the result to fall in the alternative hypothesis. Okay. It's a little bit more expansive than that, but that's kind of the short version. Do you have a question? Do you have a question? No. Okay. Sorry. Thought you put your hand up. Um, okay. So going back to the slides and we're going to talk about some more jury panels. Oh, before that, we're going to do a question. All right. So can we conclude that maternal smoking causes lighter birth weights? All right, get those answers in. All right, so perhaps conclude is not quite the right word we mean, but we can make, does anybody here know what a hedged bet is? Or what's a hedged bet? So it has a kind of more, let's say, positive world use as well in uh, basically in, in market trading. Um, but that's essentially it. It's basically when you're trying to control for your bet, right? So, so I would try to say is like, you can make a really good hedge bet here that your birth weight is impacted by maternal smoking. So you're not 100% sure all the time, but you can make a really good bet that, or like, let's put it this way. You don't need to make a hedge bet because your chances of getting it are very, very high. Okay, so um, you know, in the in the case of the Botox stuff, right, that was a ninety nine percent chance that you'll be correct, right? Uh, in our other example, I don't remember what the oh, uh, we didn't actually do the p value, so whatever. Uh, I know it's in the ninety five something percent range, so um, you know, you have a very good chance of it getting, of it being correct. It is still possible that it won't, but as a result, we can make a choice to conclude that this is true, okay? With a certain confidence level. And we'll talk more about confidences or confidence levels uh, in a future lecture. All right. So, so the importance of random assignment. So um, if we look at this data or look at this picture, right? So this is the Apple App Store and Google Play Store and the share of app consumer spend worldwide by year. Um, and this is the percent that was spent on, you know, in the dark blue Apple, um, uh, Apple App Store. So people pay, paying for software um, and versus the Google Play Store. Um, what's wrong with this data? Like, why, why is that? Like, the implication here, right, is that the Apple App Store is significantly more effective at making money than the Google App Store. But what's wrong with it?
So, so those are some good examples. So it doesn't account for like distribution of phones, right? iPhones are, are Apple phones are, are much more prevalent in the U.S. and in Europe than they are in the rest of the world, basically. Androids are actually quite a like 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 quite a bit larger in population or in market share than Apple phones. Um, so that like maybe that's skewing it either way. Like it, it's hard to know, right? Whether whether that means that Google is actually so much worse than it looks. Right, or it could also be that there's less pay-for apps in the Google Store than there is in the Apple Store. Um, those are two things. Shoot, because I had a really simple example. Um, now I can't remember what it was. But does anybody have any, have any other ideas? What might be wrong with this? Yeah. Yes, well, no, so it does mean that. The thing is, what it isn't clear on is, um, uh, like, yeah, so so it is 100% of total app consumer spent, but it doesn't really mean, like, is that when you click on the place, that, you know, the Apple Store or whatever, and you click buy now, or what if it has a, uh, a you know, kind of a thing in the actual app where you can, like, upgrade? Right, and you spend money there. So maybe most of the Google Play apps are uh, pay later, right? And most of the Apple apps are pay now, uh, and that would also account for this and not be really. Also, Apple has more of a Walmart approach to how developers work on their app store. So if you offer something on the app store, they don't want you to send people to a website to purchase it. Right. So it's possible. Exactly. So, so those are just a few of the problems with this example. Um, but the fo most fundamental one here that we're talking about, right, which is that um, this is not randomly assigned. Okay. So because of the earliest example that we were given about the problems of this, which is something like iPhones are more available in the U.S. and Europe than they are abroad, or than uh, the rest of the world. Sorry. Um, for example. Um, does that make sense? So, so you have like these these groups that are, are kind of self-selecting. It's like my stupid example of, you know, if you ask a, a person where they work and you stand outside City Hall, you're going to get a different, you know, you're going to get a skew, right? All right. So, oh, I actually have an explanation side. I forgot about that. Um, so, uh, and so basically, yeah, so is the higher spending actually caused by users owning the phone? They're not randomly assigned, and they, they actually contribute to their phone purchasing decisions. Um, so, yeah, look, I wrote it beforehand. Uh, all right, so this is why we think it's so important to deal with, if, if at all possible, right, randomized controlled experiments, which we've talked about, I think, before. Um, but this is kind of what they're formally called. And so if you can select the treatment and control groups at random, then we can make causal conclusions. Um, however, when we don't, it's going to be something else. Um, and so because you've, you've narrowed the scope of the possibilities to be basically chance or the treatment. Okay. So how do you deal with making it just the treatment? Any ideas? You know, how to get rid of chance? A lot, right? So, so either collect a lot of data or simulate a lot of data. And that's how we reduce, we'll never get it to zero, but we'll reduce the, the impact of chance. Okay? How are we doing on time? All right, another question. All right, what is, a reason for the difference between two groups. We talked about this a moment ago. I like when we have questions and I can drink water.
right. Ooh, everybody's in. All right. So this is a very this is a really important concept. So it is definitely both, and we can't ever get rid of chance altogether. Okay. So it can't be just treatment. It's always treatment and some amount of chance. Okay. We just want to try to control for, and it's I hate to use the same word again, but you know we want to minimize the way chance impacts uh, our outcome. All right, so talking a little bit about randomization. Okay, so before the randomization, each participant can only draw one straw. Right now they have potential for either, right? So they can either be getting treatment or control. I don't know why control is like the short straw. I don't know. I wasn't really thinking when I made it. Um, and then basically you end up with two groups, right? So you end up with your control group and you end up with your treatment group. But then we have them evenly divided that are and randomly distributed, right? So, you know, it's, it was random how that happened. We just make sure that we only take enough, right? And then we separate the groups to look at the data, right? Well, first we separate the groups to give this group the treatment, right? And this group, no treatment. And so then we get to the hypothesis is that when we're talking about like the Botox example, which is what those were meant to represent, um, the distribution of all potential control scores is the same as the distribution of all potential treatment scores. So the null hypothesis is what we don't really think is gonna happen, but it's where zero is, right? So, but the alternative is that in the population, more of the potential treatment scores are one. So pain improves. This is why I, I don't think it, it must not be Botox. I must just have, maybe I have a typo in the variable name. I can't remember what it's supposed to be, but because um, I don't think Botox is generally used for pain unless I'm losing it. Uh, so, but basically the alternative is kind of what we're expecting to happen or hoping will happen or whatever you want to call it. Um, but we obviously want to treat this like science. So we're not going to just decide it's one or the other. So, and wait, let me just see. Oh, okay. We are not, we were not supposed to switch to the notebook yet. Okay, so next we were going to talk about TVD. I don't know, maybe we'll do kind of a brief version because we're uh, kind of running out of time. Um, okay, so this discussion is about the Alameda County jury pools um, and the report, a report by ACLU. Can anybody know what the ACLU is? The American Civil Liberties Union. So basically they, they're uh, like a lobby group or, um, I don't know, let's just say like a nonprofit organization that tries to fight on behalf of civil liberties, uh, specifically in the US. Um, but so they did a report on this. And so what they were looking at was um, the jury pools for and trying to figure out the racial and ethnic disparities. So this is similar to the case we talked about last time. So basically what they wanted to do was and as you can see, in California's Code of Civil Procedure, it says all persons selected for jury service shall be selected at random from a source or sources inclusive of a representative cross section of the population of the area served by the court. So, if you know, if you didn't realize this already, lawyers and lawmakers are paid by the word. Um, so that's why it can be very word. Uh, so, eligible juries in a county list of eligible residents, and then you get the jury panel, and then you get the actual jury. And I think maybe we'll jump, yeah, we'll jump the demo for today and come back to it next time. Um, but, and we'll kind of review it then too, because I want to get to the, what is TVD before we kind of leave from here. So distance between distributions. So people on the panels are multiple ethnicities and the distribution of ethnicities is categorical. So what we want to do is figure out um, 
you know, basically, are we tri are we getting the right the right jurors on our panels? Okay, based on the ethnicity of the population, etc. So TBD. I like this slide. This is why I wanted to get to it. Uh, this is not the Vampire Diaries, which I thought was hilarious because I googled TBD and just page after page of Vampire Diaries. <laughs> Uh, it's funny when you look at things in two different contexts, it, it doesn't even click for you that the acronym collides, you know. Um, but so it's the total variation distance. Every distance has a computational recipe. But for each category, you compute the difference in proportion between the two distributions. So this is kind of what we've been doing so far, is that we're trying to compare these two populations, right? Uh, you know, of like the different, when we're doing the sampling, the shuffling the labels and stuff, we're trying to compare that to our other data sets so that we can see what's the variation distance, okay? And we'll get into that in more detail. And basically, in a lot of ways, the kind of the rest of this class, the rest of this semester, is kind of all about this, is like finding ways to show how do we get that, that distance between what we think is true and what the, like, or the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis, okay? And then there, and kind of all the different techniques we can use to try to accomplish that goal. All right. Questions? Like I said, we'll, we'll get more into TBD and like a demo and stuff next time. All right. So.